Hello and welcome to the Null Channel. This is part one, section one. Now in the last episode, we learned and installed Rust, got it set up and set up our dev experience. Now, let's start learning about variables and functions in Rust. Last episode, I kind of slapped this if statement in our main function here, but this is really not that helpful. So let's go ahead and just delete it. Oh yeah, we're going to just jump into the code today. And you know what? We'll probably do that pretty much every day. So you better pull up Visual Studio Code before starting these videos. Feel free to pause and rewind any time that you need. I think you will learn the most by participating with me and doing these alongside. There are four basic tasks that every language supports, and they're really your day-to-day -day drivers. That's variable assignment and access, as well as creating and calling functions. Yeah, I just kind of boiled your job down into four very repetitive tasks. You're welcome. All right, as you may have guessed, main here is the entry point to our application. This is the function that gets called when the OS starts your application. We're going to cover more on functions in just a little bit in this lesson, but this is our entry point. This is where your application begins. Everything starts here. First things first, let's figure out how to assign variables. All the cool kids are doing it. As Rust is a statically typed language, it is type safe and type information is known at compile time. This means that when a variable is created, it is of that type and that type for the entire scope of its life. Simple case, we wanna store some data. Now remember that in Rust, it does matter if something is created on the stack or heap, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. Just know that these primitives that we're talking about right now, the integers, are created on the stack. Just remember that the stack is fast, but its values uh, have to be of constant size. But we're gonna talk more on that, more on memory in another lesson. Don't worry, I know that memory and memory management can be scary, but it's really not that bad. And I'm gonna keep bringing it up in little bits so that it can you know, slowly sink in and you're gonna realize it's really not that hard. Anyways, let's get back into the code. Let's go ahead and make a variable. We're gonna just go ahead and do let number equal five. This is really not that bad. Let is the keyword that says we're going to assign a new variable. We named our variable number and we assigned it to the number five. So this isn't really that useful if we run this it's actually going to print out the exact same thing. And again, Rust is awesome, and it's gonna tell you this is unused. This is a warning. This could be a bug. If you planned on using this variable, it's not used. So let's fix it. Let's, let's use the variable. Print line, the number is number. All right, let's break this down. Okay, so let's let's run this and see what it does. Cool, we got rid of the warning because we're now using our variable. It's much more useful now. And you'll see that it printed out the number is five. Many of you will be familiar with this type of annotation and we're gonna be doing more and more on that because I know a lot of you experienced programmers are thinking right now, what if number is a complex type? How does it print out to the screen? And we'll get into that in just a little bit. Now, a lot of it just happened on these two lines, and I'd like to just take a second to step back and walk through exactly what happened on them. When we ran it, you can see we got the number is five. This first line here is assigning the variable uh, number to five. Now, this is really cool. If you're following along and you've used Visual Studio Code like I have, it's already going to tell you the type that number is. If you hover over it, you'll see Visual Studio knows it's an I32, or this is an integer, um, a 32-bit integer. Wow, that's super cool. Now remember, this is not duct typing, it is statically typed. 
This number cannot be anything else. It must be a number the rest of its life. It's just really important that you don't think that this is duct typing because it absolutely is not and does not share any of the same issues that arise from duct typing. We cannot assign some other variable type to this. It is an I-32. Okay, let's jump to the next line. This almost looks like a function, but it's not. It has a name and it has an open and closed parentheses just like you would expect from a function call. But you'll notice there is this exclamation point and if you're in an IDE like Visual Studio Code and hover over it, you'll actually see this is from the STD macros. And that exclamation point says it is a macro. This is one of two different types of macros that Rust supports. And Rust has amazing support for macros. It's just absolutely amazing. Now, we're not going to dig too deep into macros today. I just wanted to point it out. I do have a lesson all around macros. And if you stick around to the later parts where we're actually making projects, we're gonna be making our own uh, macros. It's gonna be pretty awesome. So let's just make sure that this is working. Like this isn't statically there. And uh, let's go ahead and change this number to 10 and run the code again. Beautiful, beautiful. This is fantastic. All right, elephant in the room time. This is an I-32, but let's say we really wanted it to be uh, an I-64. We wanted it to be a, an unsigned 64-bit integer. Now we have a problem. Now, there's actually two reasons. One, the implicitly typed is failing you, or sometimes it's really good to explicitly type your variables for clarity. I think that that can be very helpful some of the time. So let's explicitly type this as a 64-bit unsigned integer. All you would do is Visual Studio Code is showing you how to do it. You type colon u64. This is now a unsigned 64-bit integer because we wanna store a lot of data in there. Okay, so don't take my word for it. Let's run it and make sure this works. You can see this worked just as we expected the other ones to work. This is fantastic. Now you might be thinking, what else can we do here? But let's take a quick segue about primitives really quickly. You have the usual suspects here. For integers, you get signed and unsigned. Uh, 8 to 128 bits, as well as the standard I size and U size that are architect architecture specific. Let's not dive too far into primitives. It really has all of the usuals you expect to find with bools, chars, and floats. It also has a tuple container primitive, and that's actually pretty cool, although it can also be abused. Um, but we're gonna use all of them in the future while programming. So let's get back to our little app right now. Let's make a function. And you know what? Let's make the function add. I know it's kind of dumb because we can just add anyways, but it's a start. Remind, remember, assigning variables and writing functions are the two largest things you are going to be doing in just about any language. So let's start out with a strong foundation. Let's start with a function looks like. A function looks like this, fn, um, and then its name, and then its inputs, and then its outputs, and then the scope. These curly braces, uh, Rust uses curly braces to denote scope. And so, uh, yeah, let's write our own. Knowing that, we want to add two integers together. How hard can this be? Fn, we'll call it add to just be original. Open braces. Not so bad. Not so bad. So now we want to take in two integers. How might we do that? Let's say this is integer one, and it's of a i32, and this is a number two, and it's of an i32. So this is the name, so we could come up with a better name for this. This could be x and this could be y, if it was a coordinate system, whatever you wanna name your variables. Um, I'm going to stick with number two. I'm just gonna make it explicit, nice and easy, number one. All right, now we need to decide what we wanna return. In this, we're going to just return another i32. All right, so let's return an i32. You do a little arrow. I don't know why they picked the arrow. This is probably one of my biggest pet peeves. Why do I need an arrow? Why can't I just write it here? I don't know. 
you need an arrow. And we want to give it an I-32. Cool. And now we need those curly braces to denote the scope of our function. Open curly brace, and there we have it. Now, if we go ahead and run this, check this out. Well, it couldn't compile this. It expected you to return an I-32, but we returned nothing. And Visual Studio Code is telling us the same thing. It's a mismatched type. Okay, well, this is an easy fix. Let's fix it. Let's return, return number one plus number two. Oh, let me spell return correctly. All right, now, super cool here. Let's go ahead and run our little program, see if it compiles. And this time it compiles. We do get a warning that says, ads not being used. Well, we'll, we'll fix that in just a little bit. Now, I wanna pull your attention back to this. I said that every single line has to end with a semicolon, and that's not quite true. We could rewrite this whole thing. Let's, I'm just gonna copy it and paste it really quickly. We could rewrite this whole thing like this. This is our ad number two. Delete that semicolon and delete the return statement. This is also a valid function. In Rust, if you have the last line of a function be the return type, be the valid return type, you don't have to put return and you don't have to put a semicolon. Okay, so let's actually use our function. Let's do this. Let number two, uh, number two equal add number and number. We're just gonna pass this 254 in twice. And then let's print this out. Oh, this is really cool. So we have a problem, we have a type mismatch. Our function is expecting 32-bit integers. We specifically assigned this a U8. Now, the easy fix here is just to delete this because this is going to automatically give it an I32. The really, really cool part about this, uh, something that you wouldn't get in a normal class, that's for sure, is that Rust is pretty smart about it. It will look at the full stack to see what that number needs to be when it implicitly types. So let's check this out. What if we change these to I64s? Holy crap. Rust understood that this needed to change, that this needed to be an I-64. Even though it has the same number here, Rust is looking at the whole stack to see what that needs to be. It knew that it needed to be an I-64. Again, this isn't duct typing. This is the static compiler being really smart. So we just saw the type safety being uh, tested and we got to see the implicitly, the powers of the implicitly typed uh, variables. Again, we can just change these back to I32s and you're going to see Rust implicitly retype it because it knows what it needs to be. This is super powerful. Now I have one last thing that we need to touch base with before this lesson is up. Right here, we added these numbers together, and that's cool. And we assigned this number to this. But what if we wanted to change this number? What if our logic mandated that we change this number? Can we do that? Well, let's give it a try. We'll say number equals 567, or 5,667. All right, cool, uh-oh. Rust didn't like it very much. Let's see what uh, Visual Studio says. Value assigned to number is never read. Maybe it's overwritten before read. This is a little weird. And we can get into why you might get this error, but let's check the next error message. Cannot assign twice to immutable variable number. This is the crux of the issue. Now, I actually have a whole lesson on mutability because as soon as you start getting into memory management, I, th I find that it helps people to re-go over mutability as well, just because you added more complexity in. But what this means here is if we want to do this, and if we want to then print this out, new, new number, like this, 
This is just not going to work. But if you want it to work, you have to do this. Now this number is mutable. And this makes a whole lot more sense when you understand the structure of memory and how it's working in memory, but don't worry about it right now. You don't have to worry about it. All you have to know is if you want something to be mutable, you're gonna have to make it mutable. Let's go ahead and run this and see how it works. Beautiful. Now I'm gonna throw in some other examples in the Git repo. So go check this code out if you're a little confused. Go ahead and check it out. It's there for all of you to see and use and experiment with it. So go for it. But now that we have a function, you know what we should do with it? What we should try to do the entire class as we do new things? We should test it. It's gonna be something we dig more into throughout the entire series. We're gonna to be touching base on testing and how we test our Rust code and how Rust lends itself to being test. So if you wanna learn more about testing and you wanna know more about Rust, join me in the next lesson as we'll write some tests for our code and learn the ins and outs of testing in Rust. It will be just as in-depth as this video. We're gonna dive into random little niche things and hopefully you come out understanding how to make really great uh, tests, uh, to make sure that your documentation is tested properly, uh, the examples in your documentation, to making sure that everything is linted properly, and making sure that unit tests run in an orderly fashion. All right, remember, if you like this video and it helped you learn Rust a little, please go ahead and like and subscribe and let me know how it helped you. Uh, thank you very much. Have yourselves a fantastic week.